Okay, this is Tech Talk Tuesday, uh, and this this Tuesday we're going to look at uh, uh, buzz roll studies from the Master Studies book, Joe Morello's Master Studies book. But before we get into that, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about what this is. If you haven't uh, seen this yet, uh, I, I do a master class every Tuesday. I call it Tech Talk Tuesday. I mean, Tech Talk is could be on any time. Um, it's an, it's an ad hoc it, it, streaming event, but every Tuesday we do we do a scheduled event, a uh, master class on something. And today is uh, buzz roll studies. And there's also there's a chat room uh, in the group uh, uh, tech, tech Talk, and the chat room is called Tech Talkers. And uh, uh, if you if you want to, you can you can come in and join the group and join the chat. Uh, and then interact with me directly if you'd like or interact with the other people in the group uh, uh, that are watching and the chat remains open 24-7 so uh, the, 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 the conversations can continue and uh, be accumulated over, over the Tuesdays so uh, this is the book you're looking at the book here and this is the, the first page of this section of the book. It's page 20. I'm going to get my glasses. I can't really uh, read without my glasses. So, and I, like to, I, I just want to read you what he wrote so that uh, at least we start from his perspective. <clears throat> it's the least we could do. Uh, eighth Notes with Buzz Rolls. Uh, going from single strokes to buzz, multiple rebound strokes, requires uh, a different pressure, which is controlled primarily with the fingers. <clears throat> the important thing to remember here is that pressure does not mean rigidity or tension. So these exercises then will help develop the sensitivity in the fingers that is necessary to control this pressure must be able to immediately apply, apply the pressure when needed for a buzz and then be able to immediately release it for single strokes. Okay, we already have... We have Randy lurking. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> there are a variety of ways to play this uh, section following a few suggestions. And like I always said, uh, he always uh, makes a few suggestions and then, and then encourages encourages uh, us to make up our own. <laughs> All right, Bert's in the house. There we go. The crowd's starting to gather. Good, I'll take my time. Uh, so the way uh, the suggestions he makes to begin with as a starting point would be play without accents and then play the buzz notes as staccato as possible, then play the notes as legato as possible, uh, play, the, play the buzz notes as double strokes instead of closed rolls to open rolls. Wow, yeah, drum set suggestions, you think that a drum set? <laughs> Hi Ron. <laughs> uh, and accent the bus strokes with the bass drum. And he, and he actually writes out that particular example, which is really a great uh, 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 solo motif. A lot of guys do this without even buzzing. I mean, just the idea of uh, doing unisons with the bass and snare drum against the pattern is, uh, or even solo without any pattern at all. Uh, I see Mark Giuliani do that kind of stuff all the time, and she's really great. At that, but here it is where where you could you, you put an oscillato around it and and put some buzz strokes in. That's basically what he's doing here. Okay, play buzz notes on the tom toms, getting a muffled effect by pressing the stick into the head. You see a lot of guys doing this these days. Uh, another terrific motif to get into: change your sound, change change the feel, change the mood. Uh, play buzz notes on the snare drum and all others on the tom toms, yes, which is the reverse of what you would, you know, what, what he was doing originally. 
always invert whatever you're doing. Do it left and left hand. Do it right hand. Do it uh, foot and hand. Do it hand and foot. <clears throat> Across them, left hand against right foot. Right right hand against left foot. <clears throat> And then he goes into the exercise, and we're in. Now we're in. Okay, we're in. Here we go. And there's number one. And you see, what he's doing basically is giving you a buzz for an eighth note, and then a bunch of a uh, bunch of eighth notes after it. And then he's uh, displacing. You can see already where he's going to go on the first two lines. And then he's displacing. To the end of one, with the with the e of one, depending on whether you want to talk about common time or cut time. I don't. I don't even want to talk about what the count is. Uh, if you're counting it, then you don't really know the grid. And we're talking about a grid here. We're talking about a buzz grid now. It could be an accent grid. It could be a and you, you can do the grid with any rudiment you want. And that's the concept, basically, is to be able to control exactly when you want to buzz and be able to stop exactly when you want to stop. It's a very, very simple concept. And he writes it with an accent because it's easier to execute it with, behind an accent. It's much harder to do this without gaining some uh, momentum with a buzz. Right, so that, that's, that's the exercise. Now we should talk about buzzing. What is he talking about? Short buzz, long buzz, double stroke? What is all that? I guess I need a pair of sticks now. I don't need this anymore. <laughs> right. Buzzing. We have single stroke, and that's and that's a that's a form of a long tongue. It doesn't sound like a long tongue because I'm doing it so slow. But if I if I could do it at 110 times per second, then you then you would hear a low A. This is much closer to the long tone. It's faster, and I can play it. You know. So you get the idea. But we'll, we'll, you know, it's it's quantized sound. It's it's sound that gets closer and closer together until our ear uh, uh, could assume that it's a long tone, and then eventually you get fast enough, and it becomes a long tone. That's one way to do it. That's, a, that's a, probably the most energetic way to try to play a long tone. Then, uh, so we, uh, and also, there's an acceleration problem, there's a volume problem. And this really, the single stroke uh, demonstrates quite a bit of what our abilities are. You know, when we when we when we execute it as a rudiment, you know, it's really what it's about. It just exposes us. You know, how much power do we got? How much speed do we got? How much endurance do we got? It's all there to look at. So that so we get into a double. It doesn't take as much energy. So we get, it helps with our endurance. And it's much easier to get a long tone uh, rep replica. <laughs> I don't know, it's not really a long tone, but I mean it's, it's closer to sounding like the real thing. And then the next step, of course, is more than two rebounds, three, four, whatever. 
And that's that's where we get into the distinction between open rolls. I'm doing an open roll here. It's very difficult to tell the difference between an open and a closed roll when you're playing it that tight and that fast. And as I open it up, you can really tell there's two strokes in there. Now, if I use a little additional pressure, and I back off right away, I mean, this is touch now. This is, this is why the accent helps. Because you need an initial, you need the initial to get the bounce going. But you, you got to back off so that it's, it, it sustains. And your sustain is limited by how much you can get it to bounce. And you can control the length of the bounce and the speed of the bounce with the amount of pressure and height. So, so this is what he's talking about, about a short staccato bounce. You could use other tom toms, right? Uh, he, this is the opposite where he's talking about. Let's try to do it as long as we can do it. Try to get as much. You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. But I'm re I'm just taking it to the extreme. So, you know, how much can I get it to balance? Now, you know, the idea is that we have to control it to some degree so that we can direct it the way Joe is telling us. So I can control the length and the speed. And I'm basically doing this from my fulcrum. How much pressure I'm putting on the fulcrum. So it's all it is. I, don't, I, I want to use all of the mass of my hand behind the stroke because that mass gives me an assurance and the momentum. It helps me, you know, but, but the, uh, what, what Joe was talking about is the finger pressure comes at, the finger pressure comes at the uh, balance point or the fulcrum, wherever your fulcrum is supposed to be. The closer you are to the balance point, the more you're going to get more response you're going to get out of this. You know, if I bring my fulcrum out of the balance point to the stick, it gets very prohibitive. There's no sensitivity in that. I can't, I can't, because the balance disappears. And if I go too close, I have the same problem. But if I get to the balance point, I get full response from the, from the pressure. And then I can learn to control this pressure. And even control it in the number of strokes I want to do that with. You know, I'm using a combination of wrist finger motion, and bounce. It's not any one of those things, it's all three of them. Yes, Zach says, ah! Good, I like that, that's enough for me. Balance point makes more sense now. Yeah, this, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the science behind the stroke. So the balance point is what gives you uh, the efficiency of the transfer of, of momentum to acceleration. And it's the acceleration of the, of the stroke that gives you the power response. And it and allows uh, uh, repetition at lower levels at closer intervals. That's really what's going on with the stick. I don't care what you're doing in your hand. I mean, yeah, I, I, I care what you're doing in your hand because your hand has a lot of mass. And I want to direct that mass properly behind the momentum so that I, I efficiently use the momentum available. The more mass I can put into it, the more momentum I'm going to create, the less mass, the less momentum I'm going to create. It's another way of balancing the volume.
or the speed. <clears throat> All right. So that's what he's talking about. Hey, he's talk so he's talking about doing it with double strokes and doing it with this way and doing it doing it this way and doing it without any accent behind it. All right now, now I can talk about different styles of 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 rolls. I mean, we're talking about different technical classes of roles. I don't even know. Has anybody ever written this down? Uh, I guess I should write a book. I don't want to write a book. Watch my video. Okay? Watch this. Now. So, the first is a military role. Which is you, which is just open. And it's in time. It has a, it has a pulse. And you speed it up, that's all. And you learn to control it and bring it down and speed it up and but you want to keep it I mean, you know, from this to that, you got to be able to go nice and smooth and relaxed and controlled. You know, and, and, then, and then you get into the closed military style. Also has a pulse. sticking, but, but I'd rather not hear the pulse. I want to feel it, but I don't want to hear it. So I might adjust uh, the frequency uh, that I'm using. Either it's you know, a two frequency or a three frequency or a four frequency on the stroking of the roll. from my middle. And then there's the orchestral roll, which, have, which is not supposed to have a pulse. You know, the, the, the classical music was around way before rudimental drumming was. The history of classical music goes back about 500 years. Rudimental drumming is what? 100? 125. I mean, you know. So anyway, the purpose of the role in classical music was to, to give us the ability to play along tone. So, and there was no there, there was no need or want for a pulse at all. So the way I learned, and and this is the way I learned to play a press roll, uh, was to just go strictly by the sound of it and try to eliminate. So I don't want to do anything regular. <coughs> I don't know if anybody else does this, but I'm not. This is what I do. You know, so I can adjust the length. And I can adjust the speed of the stroke, but here I'm not trying to fit it into a pattern, a, a pulse pattern of any kind. I'm just trying to facilitate the seamlessness of the sound, so I could 
easily change any of that to change whatever the physical reaction is that I'm dealing with. Because I don't really know how it's going to respond until it responds, and I may change what I'm doing from moment to moment, depending on how the bounces happen. <laughs> you know, so it's really, it's like an improv. I don't know what's going to happen. Let me... Let me give you the big, the big shot of this so you can really see what my fingers are doing as much as possible. I mean, there we go. So this is a little bigger. It's only one viewpoint, but we don't need much more than this. That's why I set the mirror up so you can see a little bit of an angle on it. So I got choices. I can do it quickly, with short ones. Or I can, or I can slow it down and, do, and elongate the presses. And then if I want to get louder, I'm going to get the strokes higher. I'm going to have to have to increase it for the volume. And so it's all, I'm not I'm not doing anything regular. I'm just responding to the sound. And to the and, and to the volume that I'm trying to develop, or the, or the dynamic I'm trying to create. So I'm using I'm using high, but I'm also I do it on a snare drum, but I can also use uh, uh, the drum itself to help me with the dynamic. Uh, you know, at, at these volumes, you know, the, the drum sounds differently here. As I get through the set, it is an actual crescendo. So if I so if I put the two things together, you know, I, can, I can use where I am on the drum head plus where I am in height plus how hard I'm pressing with my fingers. You know. But this is orchestra style. This is not... the sound of a wind instrument. <coughs> you know, someone singing or a, or, or a string, a bowed instrument. Where the vibrations are so fast, it creates a pitch, and they can sustain it as long as they keep up the frequency. So, and we have trouble emulating that on the drums, on a drum pad especially. It's a little easier on a snare drum. So it gets a lot easier when you add uh, deep drums with a lot of ring. It gets even easier when you add cymbals. But it's a textural thing. That another way of approaching the kit and the sounds that you can make. Short, medium, long sounds. Elongated, not elongated. And, this, and the press roll is one of those tools that we use in place of breathing or bowing. So, so what, how are we doing on time? Good, great. So let's switch, uh, uh, okay, so Zach is saying to me, thanks for this view, so the pressure from the fingers doesn't come from connection or lack of control. The pressure comes from the desired sound. No, it's all of that. Sometimes I, you know, when I'm playing orchestra style, I'm, I'm responding to the lack of control. <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm giving it, I'm giving up control. That's the difference between, between uh, rudimental playing and orchestral playing is that uh, rudimental playing, you're, tr you're, you're taking control of it. And I don't know orchestral uh, playing. You you don't you don't care about controlling it. All you care about is the result. <clears throat> so.
So on. Um, so, look, I know what to do. So let's uh, go back and look at the music now. Good. Jack understands. Uh, let's go back and look at the music now. And let me do some of it. So now you get it. So, so the long tone is the first partial. And you can see, you know, when, you, when you're doing this very slow, you're practicing it all because you're practicing it in rhythm and you're also tr trying to practice, you can practice at, uh, the orchestra style as well. Or, when it gets faster, you can do that. Right? You can do it slow that way. Or, and we're not trying to create nice rolls. Yeah, we can. trying to work on how fast we can do it. We're trying to work on uh, developing the buzz. You know, then you can, you know, then you can bring it up. You got to do it slow. And allow yourself to develop your buzz, uh, uh, you know, your rebound. It's all about the. Re it's always about the rebound, and that's you know we want to use as much rebound as we can. Because the more rebound we can use, the more momentum we can use, the more inertia we can we can develop. <clears throat> the less we have to do, which extends our parameters, extends you know, the less energy we have to use, then the faster we can move. And the faster we can move, the louder we can play. I mean, it's all connected. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's look at the next page and just you know, let's continue. Here's my. <clears throat> so now that you get the idea, now you can do it. Now you don't need me anymore. It's not. This is not rocket science. I mean, it's based on rocket science, but it isn't the rocket science itself. <laughs> That was page, by the way, that was page 21, here's page 22. And you can see he's just, he's going through the grid. control to direct these buzzes really where you want them at very high speeds but you need to do this very slow so uh, so that you give the space for the buzz to grow <clears throat> uh, well, let's look at the next page and the, and the work gets harder and harder yet it gets more intense
Mm. When it starts to become access to rebounds with buzz strokes, that's what it really is. Second page. Uh, um, yeah, twenty. Look at the bottom. Twenty-one. We get to the double strokes. Oh man. And the bottom line. And that's you know. Try to do that fast. another page. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do or I'm not gonna go through every one of the I mean it's really self-evident what you need to do as long as you understand uh, the setup I gave you about and the different ways of you play without accent with the accent <coughs> a short buzz <coughs> long buzz take it to the drum set <coughs> just it's just another act another accent technique is what he's showing you with a buzz accent you know, or without the, or without it, everything is with or without. So it's the control, then it's access and rebounds, and then it's buzz. And then it's double stroke, and then it's buzz, and then it's, well, you know. So, uh, I talked about. Music, it's, I mean, you, it's really uh, not fair. I'm not going to take it to the drums. Uh, exact, you know, perfect time, exact. This is exa exactly, see, I had the mouse in my hand. <laughs> can, can you give examples of how you would take this to the drum set? I'm not teaching drum set. But I'm going to take this to the snare drum. Because it's not fair uh, uh, to do this just on a pad and then tell you to go practice it. Uh, we should see how this applies to the real instrument. And you need to learn how to do this on the real instrument. This is just prep. All of this stuff is prep. Now when you take it to the drum, uh, there's a whole other set of ideas to wonder about. So let's, uh, let's look at the drum, the snare drum. This is, uh, all right, I get, you know, I'm going to move the microphone so uh, you can continue to hear me speak. Let me get at the frame here. If we put this here, oh man, if I get the bass drum, this thing's going to go nuts. But it's gonna sound really good. I'm gonna, I should do a drum solo with the mic here, right here. I have an idea. I wonder what this sounds like. So these are my Quaviados. I mean, it's set up left-handed because this, you know, I, this, we yesterday I did the, the thing with was, was it yesterday or the day before? I forget. Man, it went by so fast. I did the. Uh, that was Sunday. I did the event with, uh, with Efren. All right, so this is the snare drum. I like to keep it toned high. I like to keep it set a little bit higher, too. I try to, I try to get belly button level in the middle of the angle. And the angle facing the angle 
should come from my left hand angle. I mean, that's what it's facilitating my left hand. So that, that's the direction I want the angle to be in. My hand seems to be able to adjust better to the angle. But the left hand, the left hand was designed to play with the angle. So I want to work in line with the angle. preferences. This is what I do. I like a little bit, I like a half step up on the bottom head. Just to make it a little cleaner with the snares. I'm trying to, when I tune it, I'm very careful about when I tune it. I'm tr I try to raise all the rods up evenly. You know, you know, I tune it from here to 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 here. You know, in a, in a clockwise or a counterclockwise, either way. But I, I'm, you know, whatever I feel like. But it's, but there's a methodical, a cross over, a cross over, a cross over, just to get it nice and even when I put an attention on. And then when I get it to where I can, I can hear an overtone near the rod. Then I'm trying to, I'm, and then I try to bring the tension up and keep the keep the, the pitch of the overtones very close. So no matter where I hit it, it has the same overtones pitch. I mean, it's not a definite pitch. I mean, there's a bunch of pitches in it. It's harmonic, it's harmonic frequencies. You can hear as like, you can hear them go up. As the lower frequencies die down in energy, the higher frequencies take over. So the drum has a tendency to do a a glissando up. If you know, from from the overtone series. Now if you get away from the rim, you get towards the center, you you get away from that overtone series. And I can hear the upper ring, but there's no gliss. It doesn't ride the overtone series up because I'm not favoring it. So that right away, right away I have uh, uh, two compositional elements just on the snare drum, just from where I'm playing the head. center favors that kind of roll. The edge favors because it has the wash of the ring. It tends to wash the edges of the rolls together. So if you want to play orchestral rolls, you, you, you probably like the edge. If you like, if you like to play rudimental rolls, you probably like the center. Look at the wear on my head. This is my medium. This is uh, as little ring as possible, and then I add some ring to it. That's really where I stay. This is like adding echo to a drum track. And then if I want to. upper harmonics. I'm using the harmonics of the overtone to pitch the stroke. 
And I could do a lot of things with this. You know, I could, I could do a whole solo just up playing with the harmonics on the rim. And different, but it's very, I mean, I really need a good recording so uh, uh, you'd be able to hear all of these harmonics clearly. And I mean, there are a lot of jazz players, sax players, uh, especially uh, my friend Paul, who, who plays who gave the bass clarinet. I mean, that's all he does is plays, he's playing with these harmonics on the low end and his, with his bass clarinet, and that's what he's into. Yeah. Anyway, so you could use these, you could use this. Let's put some snares on now. So now, now we're gonna add the snares, we're now gonna add a lot of noise to what we're doing, which even helps it even more to sustain. I mean, it's one thing to sustain it here. So that's an orchestral role in the military area. And this is a military role in the orchestral area, as opposed to a military role in the military area and, a, and an orchestral role in the, orche in, the, in the orchestral area. So there's a lot of choices. Ah. And so that, and then I can put the snares on. You might have seen me do this in some of the solos that I do. Where I thought I should post that solo where I actually, I, I actually uh, uh, use the drum head itself as an element of composition. I'll post it now that I talked about it so that people understand what it was I was doing. If you just see it, you, you say, what is he doing? Why? Does it mean? <clears throat> okay. So now, now you can see when you go. short buzzes, long buzzes, near the rim, near the center. This is just one drum. Well, you add the bass drum to this, and wow. Hear what that sounds like uh, recorded with this mic. See, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do some drum solos now. So uh, you know, and and you could take it to the drum set. I mean, with the, taking it to the drum set, there's a hundred books on how to do that, including Joe's. Including, not take you know, take it to the drum set. Uh, he he put it in the first page how to take it to the drum set. He gave you you know four or five ways. So just to start with, and you start with that, start with what he suggested, and see where that takes you. You know, and it's not just about press rolls, I'm talking about anything, any of the exercises in stick control, or any of the other books that you're working with. It's all, it's the same. If you do one of them, you can do all of them. If you know how to read and you have enough technical 
<coughs> ability to execute them, <coughs> you take them to the drum set the same way. There's a pattern, you know, that you develop for yourself, and you can start with what Joe gave us. I'm sure other books have other suggestions, and you can start compiling a combination list. Good luck. You're going to run out of time to even do them. So. But basically, that's. Uh, you're welcome, Zach. Zach says thank you. So, he must have got what he was looking for, hopefully. Well, what am I talking to? Yeah, I mean, let me come back so you can see me. There I am. Okay, sorry. So, uh, you want to see another page? I'll show you another page. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you except to set the drums up and do it on the full kit, but you know, I don't need to do that. I mean, uh, you should do that. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to show you how to play the drums. Uh, because all I'm going to do is show you how I play the drums. I don't want to do that. I want to give you a toolkit and you go play the drums. <laughs> you go figure out what you want to play. Yeah. And there's a methodical approach to taking the, this toolkit and applying it to the drum set, but that's not playing the drums. No, that's not really taking stick control, or master studies and taking it to the drum set and applying it to the drum that's not playing the drums. I can't teach you how to do that. I can teach you how to do masters, I can teach you how to do stick and track it, but I can't teach you how to play. That's something that you have to experience yourself by playing <laughs> and with other people. And the more you play with other people and the better they are, the more you're going to learn. And <clears throat> but this this whole thing with studying is just the beginning of the process. Just just it will, it just get you on the just get, get get you on the stage, and that's where it begin. That's really where it begins. Just gets you on the table, gets you to the table. Now you got to put something on the table. All right, that's enough for the rant. What else can I show you about? Let, I'll show you another page. Let's take a look at the, the, the next page. We've got time. This is 20, what is this, 23. So here's 24, here's the one after that. And he continues with the same. Here's your, here's your you know, 27. Line 27 is your triple power, uh, tri your inverted uh, triple power little. See that? Play it. Yeah, you can you can do this in stick control. You go through the grid in stick control this way. It's the same. It's just, basically, what it did is write stick control out with a, with a buzz grid for you. The triple you no. Know.
<clears throat> you know, and eventually, you know, let's, let's continue. I might as well show it to you. That's 24, so here's 25. So now we start to put them together. This is really what I wanted to show you, isn't it? When you start putting them next to each other, then they start sounding like rolls. I can't see where the, uh, uh, yeah, this is obviously a repeat sign. So it's a four bar exercise now. Seen Buddy Rich do that a lot. Okay, a lot of guys do that. Um, twenty-five, twenty-six. Oh, I just want to get to the triplets. And then, and then the logical thing is uh, to take the control to the to the second harmonic. After working with the with the, with the first harmonic, which is your duple, the second harmonic is the triple. Is long. Triplet to show you the next step. That's as far as he goes in this particular section. I'll show you the next page. Same kind of stuff. Same kind of. So it gets interesting. I mean, you know, he's. Ooh. That's what I'll do next. Okay. Yeah. Actually, uh, Daniel Daniel Bedard gave me this idea. He posted he, he posted a video this morning of sick control with a, th a three against four. Uh, approach uh, using uh, a triplet, using the second harmonic as the basis instead of the first, and uh, it's a it's a beautiful setup to a master studies exercise, accent exercise uh, that's based on basically what he just showed everybody in that video. Great video, by the way. I didn't get a chance to comment on it. So that's what I'll do, and it also ties into this too. It's the same thing. If you just you can just add buzzes to it, and you're gonna get this. But this this exercise reminds me of, of this accent exercise that he presents <coughs> earlier, <coughs> earlier in the book. That will set you up for this, because it'll set you up for this kind of accentuation in the triplet style, 
with all this, you know, stick control kind of sticking, and an excess of rebounds kind of sticking in it. Uh, so uh, I should do that next. I should do the, uh, the triplet accent section of Master Studies next. It should be a great follow-up to this and a great follow-up to, to Danielle Bedard. Again, thank you for posting that. That's a really excellent example of what Joe was talking about. Uh, you know, just taking it, you know, to another place on your own, whatever you want to, whatever you want to experiment with. So we'll have, we'll have a, another look at one of Joe's experiments next week. Okay, I think that'd be very appropriate. So thanks for watching. And I hope this uh, helped you. You're welcome, Ron. Ron DeAngelis says thank you, and you're certainly welcome. Well, Zach has a big message now. Okay, let's let's end with Zach. Okay, I'm going to end with Zach. <clears throat> Thanks for this lesson, Alan. I'm understanding more and more what you've been saying to me all along in regards to technique and my ability to learn how to apply it to the drum set. Okay, I guess I answered Zach's question. Okay. All right, everybody. On that note, I'm going to say goodbye and remind you that you need to keep practicing. Okay.